Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for everybody to, for having joining in. My name is Carlos de la Torre, and I am the director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida, Gainesville. I want to welcome all of you and to thank our co-sponsors, the Department of Political Science at the University of Florida, the Center for European Studies, also at the University of Florida, the journal Perspectives on Politics, and Patricia Alba, the Center's Communication Specialist, for making this event possible. Our topic today is what can we learn from other populist governments to make sense of the US election? The stakes are high and America is polarized. For Trump supporters, if Democrats win, the US will become a socialist nation. For his detractors, as Professor Jason Stanley from Yale, Federico Finchelstein from the New School, and Pablo Fricato from Columbia wrote this election is about the survival of American democracy and Trump represents fascism. We have a group of first-rate scholars from diverse disciplines that have worked on populism and democracy and that will help us to put the US election in historical and comparative context. Margarita Lopez Maya is a historian and the foremost expert on Hugo, on Hugo Chavez, Venezuela. She was the Bacardi family eminent scholar at the Center for Latin American Studies in the spring 2020. Her latest book is El Ocaso del Chavismo. Nadia Urbinati is Kiriakos Sakapoulos, Professor of Political Theory and Hellenic Studies at Columbia University. Her latest books are Me the People, How Populist Transforms Democracy, and Democracy Disfigure Opinion, Truth, and the People. And our third uh, speaker is Kurt Whelan. Kurt Whelan is Mike Hoff Professor in Liberal Arts at the University of Texas, Austin. He's a political scientist. His latest books are Revolution and Reaction, The Diffusion of Authoritarianism in Latin America, and a co-edited volume with Raul Madrid, When Democracy Trumps Populism. So originally my plan, and we're going to continue with the plan, was that in order to increase audience participation, we will give 10 minutes for our speakers to talk, and then they will respond to each other, and then they will comment for five more minutes. And then I will, start to read the questions, comments, suggestions from the audience. So we will start with Kurt, and perhaps you can talk for like 15 minutes about this question. What can we learn from other populist governments to make sense of the US election? Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting debate on the eve of um, election it has given me sleepless nights because it's just so for the united states unusually tension ridden and you have a president who proclaims he doesn't want to accept the results so this is for the united states so unusual that we are in many ways induced to look abroad for ideas in order to understand what's going on because in my understanding trump is a typical populist the United States hasn't had that much experience with populism recently, but of course we as Latin America specialists know the type of political animal well because Latin American politics and history has been full of populists. And so what I want to emphasize is that in some basic fundamental ways, in terms of political strategy and style, Donald Trump is very similar to Latin American populists and we can draw inferences and draw conclusions on what Trump is doing here, what the likely results will be from Latin American experiences. Now, of course, always keeping in mind the um, differences in the United States context. So, Professor de la Torre already mentioned it with my colleague, we edited a book doing exactly that. Essentially looking at Latin American and European experiences to see what inferences can be drawn Trump. So interestingly, Trump has a lot of similarities, not only with other right wing populists, like nowadays we have Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil who is very similar to Trump and who has in many ways learned from Trump. But you can argue maybe more controversially that there are also a whole bunch of similarities with, between Trump and left-wing populists in terms of political strategy and style. So for example, Hugo Chavez. What are those similarities? I mean, essentially what you see 
with populism and what you see in all these political leaders, you see a very personalistic leader with an unorganized heterogeneous mass base. So everything revolves around the big man, Trump, this big presence, um, Bolsonaro, who is the athlete and who is going to face down um, the COVID pandemic, Hugo Chavez, everything revolved around Hugo Chavez. And so that is very typical of populism that you have a very powerful, charismatic personality who is the core and the axis of everything. And there's very little kind of programmatic commitment or ideology. I mean, yeah, these people, they spout stuff 21st century socialism and Bolsonaro has some, uh, some slogans, Trump has some slogans, but there's not at all any coherent ideology or program. Everything depends on the leader. The leader essentially raises whatever issue, whatever idea they want. Um, so in that sense, it's very personalistic, not ideological or programmatic. And these big leaders, they want no accountability. They essentially want to govern as they see fit. They want to have concentrated power. They want to have autonomy to do things the way they want. And in that sense, this is very similar. And we'll see soon how problematic that is for democracy. The second thing is that these personalistic leaders, they do not have well-organized parties. So they connect to their followers in direct kind of quasi-personalistic way. You know, remember like Hugo Chavez, a low president for hours every Sunday, he was your guest in your house because he was there and singing and laughing and joking and telling stories and doing all kinds of things. That's what Trump does with his Twitter barrage, he's always there. 80 million followers kind of see him as their sort of personal contact. So, um, so there isn't an organized, disciplined connection. So as a result of that, for these personalistic populist leaders to maintain their support, they constantly have to kind of fuel the intensity of the followers commitment. They have to rile them up, they have to fire them up. And the best way to do that is if you go on the attack, if you single out enemies that you depict as dangerous and as deleterious to the people who you claim to represent, and you depict yourself constantly in a struggle, in a conflict, because if there's a conflict and if there are dangerous enemies, then the followers has to, and they have to rally around you. They have to essentially um, support you. And so you see that effort to enhance the intensity of the connection by turning politics from democratic competition into a struggle, into a war. All of that, as you notice, is problematic for liberal democracy. I mean, liberal democracy is about institutions. It's about rules. Liberal democracy is skeptical and worried about overwhelming power. Liberal democracy doesn't want big men. So these the liberal democracy therefore has checks and balances, has mechanisms of accountability. They want to limit what an individual political leader can do. And so the logic of populism is to try to bend, to break, to overcome, to transform those checks and balances. They don't want to live inside a liberal democracy where they are hemmed in by other institutions, by mechanisms of accountability. They want to have free reign. And so they constantly push and shove and try to limit what these institutions can do. Um, you see that Trump has always tried to do this Chavez tried to do it through the constituent assembly so he could change and transform the rules. But you see, this is a problem for liberal democracy. The big leader doesn't fit into the checks and balances of liberal democracy. So there is an inherent tension. The other problem is liberal democracy is based on tolerance, on pluralism. It's based on competition 
where essentially elections decide who can govern. And if you lose, you lose and you go home. And if you win, you govern, but within limitations. Populism tries to turn politics into a war, into an attack. So that is problematic. That's dangerous for liberal democracy because they try to use all kinds of tricks to keep the opposition from winning. They try to limit what the opposition can do. And you see that right now with all these little tricks and shenanigans, oh, we are going to rule out these ballots. Oh, I'm Trump, I'm going to declare victory tomorrow afternoon. And I don't want these mail-in ballots to be counted. All kinds of ways to disadvantage the opposition, you know, voter suppression, all these kinds of things. And so populism by nature, is a problem, a significant problem for liberal democracy. Um, it fuels polarization. It turns politics into a war. Now, of course, how this plays out depends on the strength of pop the support that populist leaders can win. And it depends on the strength of the established institutional framework. And so, what we argue in this book and what we, for what we use the comparisons with Latin American countries is what you can say is Trump is a problem for US democracy. Trump has done significant damage to US democracy. This plays out quite similarly as Bolsonaro in Brazil, as Chavez in Venezuela, but with some very important differences. Because one thing is, that Donald Trump in the United States has never had actually majority support. I mean, as you all know, he got elected with a, minor, with a minority of the popular vote. He has never reached an approval rating above 50% of the vote. He is now his approval rating in the day before re-election is like 42% of the vote. So that means his mass support has always been limited. That's very different, for example, from what Hugo Chavez had. Hugo Chavez at some point had like 70% approval. Alberto Fujimori, a right-wing populist in Peru, had 70, up to 80% approval, had mass support, clearly represented the majority of the population. So if you're a populist leader and you claim to represent the people and you have 70, 80% support, who is going to stand in your way you know people just like they concede they allow you to do things the courts just kind of that's how Hugo Chavez got his constituent assembly he wasn't supposed to have one but the courts just didn't want to hem him in because he had won in a landslide he had so much support Trump Trump has never had majority support what is he going to do he can't even claim to have you know, represent the people, more than half the people don't like the guy. I think there are a number of factors that account for this limited support that has limited Trump throughout his presidency, and that makes it likely that he will lose re-election tomorrow. One factor paradoxically is that Donald Trump has not benefited from a major crisis upon assuming office. A number of Latin American populists were elected when their countries suffered from hyperinflation, which is a terrible crisis. So for example, Fujimori in Peru, Menem in Argentina, they came into office, they attacked that terrible crisis, they brought relief to the population and they got mass support. So the surprising thing is for a populist leader, a crisis can be an opportunity. Now, Trump didn't come to office in a crisis. The economy was going okay. The economy was going well. There was no really big time crisis. So Trump couldn't actually be the savior in many ways. You know, all his promises, he would bring back millions of jobs and all the kind of stuff. First of all, he didn't really do it. Second, there wasn't that big a crisis that would have allowed him to turn into a savior. And so Trump has always had limited support, paradoxically, because he didn't benefit from a crisis in coming into office. Second, that is where polarization in the United States has an interesting effect. 
There's a lot of concern nowadays about the serious damage that political, cultural, ideological polarization does to democracy. United States democracy has suffered quite a bit from this polarization, you know, still made in Congress enmity among the two parties. But again, paradoxically, polarization limits Trump's capacity to win support. 50% of the population are Democrats. They don't like the guy. Under no circumstances are they going to support him. So Trump is unable to win 60, 70, 80% support. In a more fluid setting, like in Peru with Fujimori and Venezuela with Chavez, there was in some sense available space for a populist leader to win this overwhelming support and push everybody aside. In the United States, paradoxically, polarization, which is a serious problem for democracy, on the other hand, limits the support base that Trump as a populist leader can win. So, so while there are important similarities between Trump and Latin American populists, the conditions in the United States are different and the conditions here have limited the support that Trump could ever win. Of course, there's another very important difference between the United States and Latin American countries where populist leaders manage to destroy, undermine democracy, which is the firm institutional framework in the United States. I mean, in the United States, checks and balances have suffered and have eroded a little and they're not as strong as they used to be, but still checks and balances are in place you know, Congress in the last two years has given Trump relentless heat. They have not gotten the House after the House was taken over by the Democrats in late 2018. They have impeached the man. They have imposed serious limitations on him. The courts have imposed serious limitations on the man. And so checks and balances in the United States are firmer. They are stronger than in most Latin American countries. And that ultimately rests in a constitution that is more than 230 years old, that is very, very hard to change. And that is the ultimate protection against Trump. You know, I told you that Hugo Chavez prepared his assault on power, his destruction of Venezuelan democracy through constituent assembly. Trump gets elected, says, I'm elected. I want to change the rules of the game by having a constituent assembly. And in that way, he started to transform Venezuelan politics and push the country into an authoritarian regime. I mean, Trump, in all his strangeness, all his lunacy, has never really proposed like, oh, let's have a constituent assembly. I want to have a new constitution. I want to change the rules of the game. That is so unimaginable that even Trump, with all his other interesting ideas, has never really proposed this kind of thing. And so you see institutions in the United States are stronger. They are quite strong. The constitution is very hard to change. And so the United States has a second very important bastion of defense, the strength of its institutions. So when you put those two things together, the strong institutions and the limited support that Trump has, I don't think even if he were to get reelected tomorrow that he could really undo, undermine, strangle American democracy. And so, you know, this is a very nerve wracking election. It's hard to get a good night's sleep these days. But at least if Trump were to get reelected, I do not think that you could really, you know, he has done damage to democracy, but kind of undo democracy, suffocate democracy, as it has happened in a number of Latin American countries, he can't do. And so you see similarities in Trump's strategy, in what he wants to do, in kind of the, the authoritarian tendencies that the guy has. But then you also see differences, limited support, strong institutional framework. And so, you know, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I think we can say that US democracy is going to survive this, fellow, even if you were to get reelected. So that's essentially what I conclude from looking at a number of Latin American cases of populism and then trying to apply that to the different US context. Thank you. 
Perfect. Thanks so much. So Nadia Urbinati will also answer the question and also respond if she wants to what Kurt was saying. Uh, what can we learn from other populist government to make sense of the US election? Thank you, Nadia. You are on mute. Yeah, oh, okay. thank you for having me. I'm sorry if I was late, but I had problems with my connection. So now uh, I, I have a kind of um, uh, similarity of positions with uh, with Kurt. So it's very hard for me following him because I would repeat almost the same thing. But let's try to be a little bit uh, more complicated. So, uh, and this complication is interesting to understand uh, this American case. First, I agree with, uh, with Kurt that uh, uh, Trump uh, never uh, perhaps never thought, we don't know, but certainly never pretended to occupy the constituent power place. He never claimed to restart all over again. He claimed simply to bring to uh, Washington the true majority. So he had this uh, uh, ability like a classical populist, uh, perhaps not in Latin America, but certainly in, in Europe, a classical populist, uh, using procedures, not as procedures, but as evidence of a power that is their own power. So in some sense, he had the rhetorical ability of factionalizing procedures, meaning that is not simply the majority rule, this is the good majority. Before me, as he said, in, uh, this, in uh, January 2017, there were other majorities, there were other presidents, but only this one is the good one. So he introduced this uh, strong uh, um, uh, polemical argument uh, on the opinion level, more than the institutional level. And since I think that representative government and democracy is made is a diarchy of uh, institution procedures on the one hand and opinion and uh, um, organization of consent on the other hand, I think that uh, um, Trump in these two legs remained within one of them. That is the opinion and the construction of consent more than jumping into the institutional one because I agree with Kurt, the America, uh, the US has the the protections, the guardian uh, of the US is the constitution, the guardian of the US system of politics. And it's so difficult for him to manage, for everybody perhaps to change, that this is not where, where to go. So he insisted on the opinion and uh, consent formation moments. And I think we should pay attention to this one because if uh, um, uh, 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 Trump is going to disrupt or to make a, a to mark to mark the American politics. It is precisely in this domain, which is perhaps not dramatic as if uh, uh, he would uh, jump into the institution organization. Fine, I agree with that, but it's not less um, problematic because he was able in these uh, four years. Uh, of introducing an element that I never uh, perceived so strongly in the United States until I'm, I mean, since I'm living there. The following ar uh, argument is the, no, the, the, the new, uh, this aspect is according to me characterized by his throwing uh, the issue of doubts, uh, uh, skepticism uh, over the entire political system. The putting people in the condition of not trusting, the lack of trust, not trusting in the news, not trusting in the institutions because they are manipulated by the opposition, not trusting uh, in uh, the way systems uh, work when system is against them or critic of critic of, of his uh, constituency or his power. He throw this sense of. Um, erosion of legitimacy, moral legitimacy, not institutional. It is of the two legs, he operate on the, on the one on, on opinion. And I think uh, all these uh, conspir new conspiracy uh, um, approach to politics, these, uh, uh, in, in, you know, uh, 
insisting on a um, enemies everywhere so don't trust what you see uh, there is always uh, a backstage that uh, is invis invisible and institutions don't protect us enough from that so that is terrible in my view because of course the institutions are strong but institutions are strong also because there is what rousseau would say the legitimacy through opinion that is the legitimacy from uh, consent or belief or trust, or faith, if you want to say so. And I think he was able to erode, even if not dramatically, perhaps, because uh, I hope so. I hope that he's going to uh, not to win this uh, second term, but we have to be very careful with this hope, but perhaps because, well, uh, things can be very different. But I think this is an element that is important. This, the other element that we have to, of course, doesn't change the system, no? Doesn't, but it changes the fabric of opinion, the sense of, uh, we would call not the legitimacy of institutions and the procedures, but the legitimacy of, uh, of opinion, yes, of the sense of being part of these, uh, mm, of the same people, the same uh, discourse. So he was very, Radical on that, very radical on that, and throwing suspicions on uh, uh, all the critics, throwing suspicions on all the minorities. So this uh, um, culture of suspiciousness, culture of suspicion, culture of mistrust uh, has impact. Uh, will have an impact. It has already an impact, particularly in a society that is not uh, uh, based on a strong uh, national identification as a, a, a strong majority, majority of one nation, but it's a multinational state, it's a multicultural state. And then does it to have this sense of mistrust in the, those parts that don't belong to the true part, this can be negative uh, in the, but it's negative in, the, in this kind of domain, as I said. Finally, I want to finish, uh, and because I, I I, I totally agree with the, the, in some sense with what Valen said, but while whereas I am in agreement with this, I think that the question of stability of a constitutional democracy, I would tend to call it constitutional democracy more than simply liberal democracy, um, this stability is not simply, unfortunately in this case, an issue of institutions and procedures. Uh, is more than that. Uh, and thus, uh, I think that, uh, unfortunately, we operate all the time within the minimalist conception of democracy or um, this kind of uh, uh, slim proceduralism. And we think that the, the rules of the game uh, goes by itself, but the rules of the game precisely imply that people place the game according to the rules. And this playing the games according to the rules is part of the rules of the game. So. Even if informal, formally, doesn't change the game, the way in which he plays the game invites people don't do, not to trust the rules of the game if the game is against our interest or if the game doesn't allow us to have that result. This, for me, is already a, a problematic issue. Of course, it's problematic in a non-institutional or regime change. This is not a regime change somehow. So I disagree with, with uh, those who identify him with the fascist or what he say, or what they think that is a kind of democratic fascism, which is absolutely an absurdity. Uh, but it is certainly a form of democracy that I would call it factional in which is a factional majority, is a majority against, is a majority that occupies the place of legitimacy entirely and thus declares the other to be out of the game or illegitimate or not good as the majority is. This uh, uh, embodiment of the rules within a specific game, the embodiment of uh, the majority principles within a specific majority is a transformation that Trump was able to make. I see it in, uh, in the way in which uh, he thinks 
uh, he speaks and he operates all the time with a possessive conception of his position. He is the people that they possess the institutions, they possess the game, they possess um, the, the, uh, the uh, constitution and they can uh, operate only for the good of themselves. This sense of the sovereign uh, re reduced into the majority people or the sovereign reduced to the good people is what I call the, a total radicalism, uh, uh, relativism, a, a total relativism in which uh, there is no room for legitimacy talk, talk, talk but all, only the legitimacy of those who occupy the, uh, the place. So it's a radical, uh, it's a radical factionalism. And he says so, well, uh, he has no enough support, you say, Kurt. He has no enough support, but he has enough capability of using the media day and night and stabilize this uh, direct representation, I am the people, and in the dialogue with the people bypassing institutions as if the institutions were simply secondary to his uh, real legitimacy. And this is, of course, doesn't change in, uh, in the institution, doesn't change the institutions, but change the way of thinking of institutions, the way of operating in the institutions. And uh, I hope that it doesn't come back again because in the long run, this permanent uh, uh, possessiveness of the institutions and relativizations of the institutions in the name of those who win the game, who are the best and the only good, uh, this, this may have a, a, a radical impact uh, um, as it did in many other republics in the past, uh, in which uh, the equilibrium within, between institutions and the, and, and the people uh, was upset precisely when the institutions came to be seen simply a possession of those who operated within it. So that is, in my view, the real uh, aspect, the aspect of this populism, which is inside of democracy, not outside, but uh, twisting and deforming and, and uh, you know, um, deforming uh, this democracy according to this uh, um, overlapping of the winners over the rules that allow him to win or them to win. This is what I would say in answering Kurt's positions, which I totally agree with in any case. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, before you, you answer Kurt, what for me is very interesting in this conversation is that Nadia Urbinati in a few years ago wrote that whenever we're talking about populism, we're also talking about democracy. And in this conversation, we already see that there are different ways in which democracy is understood. Uh, Kurt, you mostly understand democracy in an institutional way, as most political scientists do. But Nadia also includes, in addition to an institutional level, the level where opinions are formed and consent is constructed. So just to say that, and please, Kurt, Okay, so I fully agree that that is a serious problem. I mean, this, this questioning of the truth, this questioning of institutions, this questioning of rules, you know, what you call possessive kind of. I mean, that, that started on his inauguration day when he said his inauguration crowd was bigger than Obama's and then there were pictures and he claimed that they were, you know, falsified or whatever. I mean, I think that is a, a really bad thing. I think it is a deleterious thing. It's corrosive, essentially of the public sphere, right? I mean, when you think of it, democracy depends on public exchange, deliberation. I mean, yes, in the end, we vote and institutions are crucial, but we hope in some sense that we don't have to vote about everything because in dialogue, in conversation, we can sort out a lot of different things. We understand each other to some extent, we can approximate, and we then also see the legitimacy of the contending parties. And that is Trump just says, absolutely not. And so this is, 
a problem. This is dangerous because it, of course, lends itself to attacks on institutions. I mean, that's the spirit out of which he questions the legitimacy of the election. That's why he goes around and says he's going to declare victory tomorrow night and mail-in ballots shouldn't be counted. That's why you see all these little efforts that the Republican Party does, like in Texas, there was some hiccup in the election. They want to rule out like 100,000 ballots. So, so this, I fully agree with you that sooner or later, this also can create serious problems for the institutional framework. What I just hope and so far see is in that clash kind of, you know, the big guy who in the title of your book, me, the people, right? I am the people and I can do whatever I want because I represent the people. That in that big clash in the United States, the institutions are going to win out. Civility is going to win out. They're going to put the man out. And what I also hope is that in many ways that Trump experience as bad, as unbelievable as it has been for the United States, I hope that it will have kind of a, you know, in some sense, like Nixon's impeachment, sort of a recovery, like, whew, we avoided that problem. Now let's see how we can prevent the recurrence. What can we learn from this? And so I think one reason why I'm not that pessimistic is I think a lot of my colleagues who see scarier scenarios, they think kind of in linear ways, like Levitsky and Ziblatt, you know, oh, there's a problem and the problem is going to get worse. The typical historical institutionalist kind of path dependency, you get yourself on a slide downward, man, this is kind of scary. But, but I think things can be more kind of, I don't know, cyclical, right? You have a decline, you have a crisis, and then precisely for that reason, you try to turn things around, to say never again. I mean, the Trump experience was so unbelievable. We will try, somehow the parties have to come together. I mean, if Trump loses tomorrow, the Republican party will have some serious, serious rethinking to do. Because I mean, they, in many ways, electorally, they are betting on a cul-de-sac, right? Kind of white, less educated voters in rural areas and small towns are the core constituency. That constituency is shrinking. And so I, I hope if the man loses that we can see kind of, you know, even from part of the Republican party that's coming together is saying like, okay, let's see how we can have a bit of a new start, how we can put this democracy in a on a stronger foundation again. But but I, I fully see the risk that you highlight, which by the way, was very similar to the Latin American cases. That was exactly Chavez's thing. I own, I'm the majority, I cannot lose. I, you know, I own the institutions, exactly the same kind of thing, so. Thanks. Thank you. May I add something to that? Please. I'm sorry, I don't know. If I can interview, yes, yes, that's the idea that. Ah, uh, okay. So you respond to each other, so we can have oh, a better dialogue. Okay. <laughs> now I'd like to open this issue. Then something uh, one, you said that after Trump, perhaps there will be a kind of renaissance or a kind of uh, uh, reflection uh, of what to do in order to avoid a second Trump uh, or kind of. Uh, I think that this would be a big problem. Why? Because populism, this is not Nixon. Nixon was a, uh, a, a was outside of the law. He was against the law. He was, he was impeached. And that was a kind of uh, working of the institutions protecting this, themselves from politics. But this, in this case, there is no impeachment. In this case, um, Trump is um, attacked and perhaps it is defeated, I hope so, politically, not through the institution. And thus, in order to attack, in order to be strong enough uh, to, uh, against the populism, you perhaps have to become yourself a quasi populist. That is, um, the game of, the game of populism tends to, or risk to produce a counter game this equal in uh, value. Now, I don't want to say that Biden is a populist because he's not. However, in order to have Trump as the enemy, only Trump is the anti-Trumpist. This electoral campaign had, had only one issue. 
the issue of Trump, both by Trump and against Trump, but Trump and only Trump. So practically, he was able to absolutize, manipulate the entire uh, system. And thus, uh, the opposition itself becomes kind of uh, inoculating Trump. Now we talk about virus, inoculating Trump itself, the, within themselves, in order to win against the Trump. This, for me, it's a little bit uh, problematic because it is empty, the empty shelf of the Democrats. Democrats, they have only the anti-Trump. They didn't develop a cogent program. Of course, we know that politics are, uh, electoral campaigns are more and more commercialism, more than proposals, uh, proposals of, uh, of um, you know, uh, programs. We know that, but this was a particular case. I mean, in this case, I never, I, if somebody asked me what Biden proposes, it would be very hard for me to summarize a, a cogent uh, answer. I don't know the de facto. And in this sense, um, well, well, I don't know, perhaps Trump transformed the Republican Party and transformed also the Democratic Party. And thus, perhaps even if, uh, uh, he does not get into the White House for the second time. It's not that, well, we close the book, everything is in order and we are safe. This is not the case because the style is there, the method is there and the erosion of political parties produced by this rhetorical populism is there. Carlos, do you want the discussion going, or do you want to have Margarita join? Why don't we finish? <laughs> no, everybody. I was about to wait an hour more. Thanks that they sent me a message. Oh my God! I, I, I almost missed the panel. <laughs> so why don't we finish this topic first, Kurt and Nadia, and then we move to another one, and we start with Margarita. So, so um. I, I agree with Nadia that this election has turned essentially into a, re a referendum on Trump. And I think that is very, very common. That's what you had in 95 with Fujimori. There was an opposition, totally heterogeneous, was essentially Fujimori, yes or no. That's what you had with Chavez in many ways. It was Chavez, yes or no. Um, I think the big difference is that in the, that in the United States, you have how should I say, the non-populists who defend civility, liberalism, pluralism, democracy, essentially can win a majority, whereas in Venezuela, in Peru, they clearly couldn't. And so that is, I think, one thing. So I don't think that the democratic opposition in any way is populism. And I think in the United States, you do not have to fight populism with populism. In other settings, maybe you do. But in the United States, fairly high education level, strong liberal tradition, a lot of experience with democracy in the United States, you can defeat a pop, or hopefully <laughs> you can fight a populist with non-populism, not with kind of counter-populism. The second point I want to make is about the Republican Party. I mean, it's interesting, after losing in 2012, the Republican Party thought that they had to reach out to minorities, for example, Latinos. That's the reason why you had that effort at an immigration reform. They thought that they were going into a cul-de-sac because their vote base, kind of whites, nowadays less educated, more rural, small town, that is a shrinking part of the population. And they see they saw that this was not a winning long-term strategy. Then comes Trump and in some sense surprisingly shows if you can mobilize enough deplorables, if you can appeal with enough intensity, you can actually still win an election on that narrow base. And that was a narrow base, 46% of the vote in 2016, but it is a shrinking base. And so, the Republican Party, if they're halfway smart, they have to see that this is not for them a winning strategy for the party. They are pushing themselves ever more into a narrowing cul-de-sac. So that's the reason why I have to hope if Trump loses tomorrow, they say, look, Trump could pull that off for the party that totally doesn't work. We have to get ourselves out of the Trumpian 
cul-de-sac. Now, of course, very hard because a lot of the base are fired up Trumpians in the Republican Party. But I think a lot of the leaders and the politicians see like, man, this is not going to be a winning strategy. And so what I hope is that would be part of the Republican, especially leadership, that would say, look, we have to somehow get ourselves out of the Trump cul-de-sac. That is you're you're optimistic. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we go to a second round of questions? And this has to be deal with the temporality of populism. I mean. In Latin America, we have had populism in power for around 10 years, right? Peron was about 10 years first. Same thing with Chavez, perhaps it was a bit more. Correa was 10 years, Evo Morales 13. But after populism, you can have a reconstruction of democracy. You can either have a backslide to total authoritarianism, like with Maduro in Venezuela, or you can go into an... an what I will call serial populism. You have one populism coming after another. So Margarita, do you want to talk about this temporality of populism and how, what happened in Venezuela? So Venezuela, who was considered to be a very strong democracy, ended up with Maduro becoming an autocracy. Well, yeah, I could talk about that experience. Um, first, what you said about we had a, a strong democracy, that is always very relative, right? I mean, uh, in, in, the, in a country that had an oil rentier economy, talk about a solid uh, democracy is, uh, is kind of <laughs> difficult. And uh, this weekend, this, the professor Juan Carlos Rey died. He was the, the person that conceptualized the, the Venezuelan democracy as a populist reconciliation of elites, a populist mm -hmm. conciliation of elites around oil revenues with the zero sum uh, political gain. And so you, you could have a zero sum, a, 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 some zero political gain when you had a lot of oil income and you, can, and you could dis distribute among your political actors um, uh, enough uh, revenue so they didn't have to do too many sacrifices. So one of the things I think that democracy has is that the actors that support democracy have to know that they have to do sacrifices, which was something that wasn't a lesson that was learned by the Venezuelan political actors. So I think the first, the first statement that Venezuela's democracy was strong is overrated. It wasn't that strong. And by 1998, it was pretty weak in its institutions It had been going on two decades of crisis. Now, and in, this, in the case of Chavez, and, and we're talking about maybe 13 years in populism as an exercising power, a populist exercise of power, and then we're talking to about now six to seven years in, in, full, in full authoritarian regime. Is it possible to, to after, and what we had as a result in Venezuela was a very strong authoritarian regime. That was the result of the legacy of Chavez. So I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that it is that you can return to, uh, to or, or build uh, uh, immediately after an ex a long, uh, severe form of populism, you could really rebuild again uh, uh, some kind of representative liberal democracy. I think it, it, it takes time. Because in the, in, it, when it becomes so extreme, like in Venezuela, uh, everything has been destroyed, all the social fabric, the political fabric. And uh, so it, I think it, it, it makes this, this situation not impossible, but uh, very difficult. Um, maybe I could say also that uh, populism became so severe in Venezuela because the institutions were very, very weak. I mean, the, the values in, of, of democracy hadn't been sufficiently embedded in the Venezuelan institutions and in the Venezuelan people. Uh, when you see the, 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 the behavior of the opposition parties in the first administration of Chavez and how they confronted, they radicalized it, uh, 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 to confront Chavez in, this, in, in, in a stark uh, polarization. And that polarization made that the, uh, that the, the, the citizens had to move 
into two extremes that were authoritarian. And so I think there was a lot to, I mean, this is a very specific country, but it has a lot to do with political culture, with weakness of the institution, with the personality of the populist leader too, which I think was one of the worst things that happened that he was a very, how could we say, low qualified leader to, to conduct a country that was in so much trouble and to, uh, to overcome that, that in, in democracy. And he was a military, which with a very important um, authoritarian culture and education. Nadia? Well, yes, I think uh, here we have thus again uh, a kind of uh, com confirming what we were saying before. One, the important role of institutions and the or the constitution, we would say, uh, and the institutions as a condition for uh, managing the temporality of populism in a way that is not dramatic or fatal. So the temporality of populism is by itself problematic and fatal because it cannot stabilize itself while remaining itself, no? How can you remain populist without adopting all the populistic strategies of attacking all the time the enemy, blah, blah, we know that. So populism cannot, it doesn't want to become a new majority as usual. It wants to be, to be all the time specifically di different, specifically populistic. So the temporality is very unstable and very short time. And for this reason, in order to um, enlarge or um, uh, become uh, stabilized through time longer, the, the tendency is to uh, ma manipulate, maneuver through the institutions and change the constitution. So, when this is easy then to do, then populism can produce disaster. Another regime or a economy. Otherwise, uh, it's a more uh, manageable or more tame. We can tame it better. So, an important issue does is could be in a few words uh, uh, rendered in this way. First, populism cannot have a long history. He, it is concentrated in a short period of time in order to remain equal to itself. This can produce either another majority after many other ones, so democracy as usual, the rules of law are the same, or in situation in which uh, it's more easy to change the constitution, the assault on the constitution in order to stabilize and to uh, solve the problem of short time uh, living. And this is the problem. So temporality is the problem of, uh, of populism in this sense. Uh, it is uh, the weak uh, element that can derail populism outside of the institution or constitutional democracy. Kurt? So, the temporality of populism is very interesting. And I think, I think sometimes, sometimes we overestimate their role and power and influence, whatever. So, you know, Carlos mentioned several cases where they were in power for like 10, 12 years. But there are also, of course, many cases where they fell by the wayside much quicker. I mean, Carlos, you know, think of Ecuador, Bucaram, six months, boom, you're out. Then comes Gutierrez, two and a half years, and boom, you're out. Carlo in Brazil got impeached after two and a half years. Lugo in Paraguay got impeached after four years. So, so populism is in many ways a bold high risk strategy and a lot of populist leaders fall by the wayside. And I think that is one thing that we often forget. And so when we assess the risk that populism poses to democracy, we tend to look at uh, Chavez and Fujimori and Orban in Hungary and Erdogan, you know, you read the famous Levitsky and Sieblatt book, those are the four cases that they focus on. And so you think like, oh my God, a populist wins, ooh, this is a problem for democracy. But many populist leaders fail. They fail, they get impeached, they get booted out. The opposition wins and defeats them first. You are a, a, a optimistic. 
I can't be. Go karam, go karam, go get it. I'm going to explain that I can't be. Okay. Trump, four years in office, boom, right? Okay, so. We'll um, see tomorrow. <laughs> but but that does seem, so on the, on the, you know, how long can they go? As Carlos indicated, there seems to be kind of a maximum length of populism, 10, 12, 13 years, you know. We haven't really had populist experiences that have just gone on for like 20, 30 years. And I think, I think, um, as Nadia mentioned, populism is by nature transitional. It's a movement, right? I mean, they don't build parties, they build movements. It's dynamic. I mean, in many ways, I think this goes back to Max Weber's notion of charisma. I mean, populists are charismatic leaders. They shake things up. They are outsiders that take on the establishment, but they're not institution builders. They don't tend to be organization builders. And so for like 10 years, 12 years, they can move, 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 and they can be outsiders. And then, I mean, either you move towards really concentrating power and moving towards authoritarianism, or you have a hard time being the eternal outsider who is an insider like Eva Morales last year. They don't have organized support. And so that does, does seem to be kind of a maximum duration. Um, you know, like Max Weber said, either you fall by the wayside or you have to sort of institutionalize, routinize charisma, and then you turn populism into something else. Now, um, when populist leaders lose power after 10, 12 years, you know, or, or when they, I mean, assume they don't move into authoritarianism like some do, like in the Venezuelan case, where I, where I date the transition to authoritarianism, like most of political science around 2006, 2008. So already under Chavez, it was not only Maduro, it was under Chavez that Venezuela turned into an authoritarian regime. I mean, we can discuss that. But so that is the one case that fortunately in the Latin American settings has not been all that frequent, partly because Latin America institutions are too weak and too volatile, you know, so after Fujimori wins the second re-election, there's a big corruption scandal and he's out. So what happens after populism? Unfortunately, I think sort of a real kind of restoration of democracy in a functioning way is not that common either, unfortunately. I think what you have is kind of low level, low quality, low intensity democracy makes a comeback, but they are usually either one of two problems. One is polarization, like you see in the Argentine case, you know, Peronism is still with us. I mean, 75 years after Peron came, there's still Peronism and it's still an axis of polarization and a serious cleavage, or then what Carlos um, mentions as serial populism. And the serial populism, I think it emerges because populism is so destructive of the party system. And so when a yes. populist falls by the wayside, like Fujimori, there's nothing left. I mean, Peru in the last 20 years hasn't had a party to, that deserves the name, right? So how can you win power in an election? You have to, in some sense, be a personalistic leader. And so you have a series of people. You have Toledo and you have Alan Garcia and you have Omala. Um, that serial populism is much less destructive of democracy. So you have kind of low level, low quality democracy, very fluid, very chaotic, you know, a good amount of corruption and problem, whatever. But it's not so destructive of democracy, partly because those serial populists, they win power fairly easily. They don't need the big crisis that Fujimori needed to win power. They don't need the big crisis that Menem needed. They win power almost by default. And so they don't have the strong mass support to do real damage to democracy. And so you get kind of populism is destruct destructive, it's corrosive. What comes after populism is usually a diminished democracy. You know, kind of, just kind of, you have the institutions going, but I mean, it's a very low quality type of democracy. So that's, that's the bad side. I, I didn't want to be too optimistic either, so. <laughs> But you were, you were. <laughs> by the way, by the way, um, that it, there is a point there that you 
And it's not just the Venezuelan case, it's the point about when, when can you consider populist leader turn, turn the regime into authoritarian, no? Because hey, this is. That's, that's the point because um, in the case of Chavez, at least, he always won the elections. So if we're talking about democracy as the majority governs, he always won the election. Until 2012, it was quite clear that he was winning the election because no matter how much he cheated during the process, the automatic um, the automatization of the of the day of that voting made it pretty transparent the results. And he and if it weren't transparent, he he won uh, with uh, when the, the the one the time that he won with less difference with his um, rival. Enrique Capriles Radonsky, he won over 11 points of difference. So I think that the sovereign will was very clear with Chavez until his death. And so it's difficult to, to take him out of the uh, uh, competitive authoritarian regime, which you can do very clearly with Maduro. But it's not so easy to do it with Chavez because he, he continued to have the popular support. And that's, that's the dimension, that's one of the most important dimensions of populism, that it is the voice of the sovereign who is speaking through the populist leader. But I think, that, I think David disagree because I mean, competitive authoritarianism, you know, these, these competitive authoritarian leaders, they win elections. They just win elections in very unfair ways on a very skewed playing ground. But I mean, competitive authoritarianism, it's almost defined by leaders that win election, you know, when you go to the Levitsky and Way book, but on a steeply unfair playing field. So, I mean, in Venezuela, that starts with Alista Tascon, right? You are an opposition no, supporter and you well, get called I out. I wouldn't agree with that, no. No, oh, no, no, of course. It means intimidation of the opposition. It means closing of, of you know, RCTV. It means massive abuse of government resources. It means politicization of the Misiones. Chavez, um, when, and when Chavez lost an election, like think, think of the mayoral race in 2008 in Caracas. So here Ledesma wins the election and becomes mayor of Caracas and Chavez says, oh, well, I'm so glad that you won. But you know what? I have a presidential commissar for, for administering Caracas and you get your budget cut and you get your attributions taken away. You can call yourself mayor of Caracas, but you are nothing. I mean, how is that respecting an election result? And so... I mean, I think, I think winning elections is clearly not sufficient. I mean, that is in some sense, one of the crucial things in a competitive authoritarian regime. Elections in a fair way, in a more or less even playing ground where the opposition has a chance to campaign, where voters are intimidated, where you don't have massive misuse of government. Well, so. well I, I mean, I, I could say, yes, all those things happen, but I still continue when I think about it when to consider Chavez authoritarian, I think about the popular will. I think about the sovereignty. I mean, the responsibility of Chavez being there is the responsibility of the people that voted for him and they voted for him until 2012. They wanted a rule of the majority. If you call that a dictatorship, okay, we can call that an authoritarian regime of the majority, but it is the majority, which is a dimension of, 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 of democracy. Now, at other levels, and, and if it wasn't uh, competitive enough, um, well, it, it, it wasn't liberal. It wasn't liberal. I mean, he, he, he wouldn't have agreed to have a liberal democracy, Chavez, and he did everything to destroy whatever was left of liberal democracy in Venezuela. But it, he did it with the will of the people. <laughs> the people authorized him to do it, you know? So I think there's a point there for me that always makes me think, and until the end of his days, Chavez had that dimension of being the voice of those who are the majority of the Venezuelan people. And it is when he, when he dies that the charisma disappears and that Maduro moves in and then Maduro tries to win with all the, the, the unequal and unfair aspects of, um, of elections abuses of all kinds, use of public, of public goods for, for, his, for, his, uh, for his campaign, everything, everything, worse than Chavez. 
and he wins with 1.4% of difference with Gabriel Radowski. And so I say at this moment, sovereignty, you cannot say the sovereign people have clearly said that they want him. They, in spite of everything else with Chavez, when you win with 26 points, when 16 points with 11 points, you are hearing the voice of the majority. But when you win with 1.4 in that conditions, you are not hearing the voice of the majority. You're not hearing the starring people. So I think authoritarian, really, for me, authoritarian, authoritarian regime begins with Maduro. And in, what we had in the middle was what you were saying before, a transitional, that people were trusting a charismatic leader. He had a lot of money, so they not only trusted him, but they were receiving goods for from him, which is my point with Trump. I mean, Trump has many features like Chavez, but is he delivering the goods that Chavez delivered? Because Chavez delivered a lot of goods. I mean, poverty went down, inequality went down, uh, all sorts of fellows of, of scholarships for children, all these missions to to you know to heal your heart to to, to give you any kind of uh, your eyes uh, if you are a mother out of wed a marriage wedlock. I mean, he will give you all kinds of goods to support you. So it's 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 for me it's difficult. I know he's, he was a, he was an, a personalist, an authoritarian man. That's I have no doubt. And he, because he was a military, he was educated like that, and he, he couldn't bear anybody to be equal to him or to debate with him or to dare to think they could they could be uh, different. They had to obey him. You know, I was once in in talking with Juan Carlos Monedero that you might know, that Spanish uh, intellectual that was in one of the advices of Charles many many years ago, and he would tell me one. He told me once something. He said, I really feel sorry for you people, the Venezuelans, because you cannot criticize Chavez like I can criticize him. Chavez didn't think that the Venezuelans had the right to criticize him, but he would hear people like Juan Carlos Monedero or who, who, uh, Zapatero or somebody, or somebody else. But the Venezuelans, no, we couldn't dare to say something to this that was different from, from what he said. So. May I ask a question at this point to Margarita, whose uh, work I like so much, and I read so I learned so many things uh, from uh, her writings on uh, this phenomenon of Chavism, or Chavism, in fact. The following question: You say this evening, but also elsewhere, that Chavez is uh, the voice of the sovereign people because he always. Um, rule with the large majority, and certainly the people is the large majority. The small minorities, the elite or the oligarchs. So we are here in a democracy, perhaps not very liberal, but democracy still. I'd like to ask you this uh, question. Um, did he uh, militate against the party pluralism or uh, in the at the beginning of his uh, uh, presidentship, uh, presidency, I'm sorry, because it seems to me, if I remember correct, if I remember well, that uh, this uh, will the people, me, uh, this this uh, general will of the people, was not so spontaneous, but it was created also through a kind of simplification of the pluralistic organizations of different voices. Uh, in terms of parties or movements. Uh, so uh, he started attacking parties as uh, uh, expressions of oligarchs, as dividing the people, fragmenting the unity of the will. So this will of the people was fabricated, was not simply the outcome of his uh, um, charisma. He fabricated, he, he manufactured his... Uh, uh, unitarian charisma with the people, and in this sense, this comes in yeah, agreement can, with the, what populism that. wants. Populism wants uh, a, a kind of simplification with the people, one a new opposition, one another one. And in in this sense, in the with the people, pluralism doesn't hold on. This doesn't mean, uh, though, that it, that was an attack against liberalism. He, it was also a way of interpreting democracy that is, for me, very problematic. For me, democracy is not simply 
uh, one will of the people, a granitic identical mass of the same voice. It is internally very articulated itself, uh, that can develop uh, different views and different... You know? So it's an interpretation of democracy uh, based on the representation of the people through his leaders that he was so good in shaping, managing, constructing uh, at the cost of, uh, um, well, um, attacking, uh, weakening the uh, uh, party pluralism or, or political pluralism, as I, uh, I, I don't know whether it's... Thank you, Nadia. That is a very interesting insight. Um, well, I, I'm a historian, right? <laughs> so yeah, I tell you. Know. <laughs> by, by the way, I, I loved your book also on liberal representative democracy. I really enjoyed it and I really learned a lot from it. I gave it to my students in, here in the University of Florida. Uh, so the first thing that I would say is that um, <laughs> Chavez, as I said, was an authoritarian man, a, a military educated to be authoritarian, hierarchical, and so on. But when he entered the, the game, he entered in a liberal, a liberal democracy. He, he won very fairly his, his election in 1998. And his power coalition, with which he went into power in his first administration, was there was a whole set of political parties, many of them of, of which were democratic. And so even if he may have had, which is something I really don't know as a historian, if he had had this Machiavellic authoritarian <laughs> project, political project since the beginning, he wasn't able, he wouldn't have been able to develop it because of the coalition he had put together in order to win that election. Uh, he, had, he had socialist uh, democratic parties like El Mas, and he had personalities from the right, from the right like, uh, like the businessmen and media owners and so on. He, had, uh, he was very much backed by civil society because he had been offering protection on human rights. And, and he was embracing participatory democracy, which was, wasn't a personal project of, of Chavez, like, like socialism of the 21st century, I would argue was. A participatory democracy was a project of, of um, social actors in Venezuela. Um, it, it, its philosophical basis are, base, are basically Catholic. And it had been pushed by opposition parties and civil society in the 80s and the 90s. So I don't, even if he was authoritarian and he wanted to be authoritarian or he was going to be, he, he came in through elections and his coalition wouldn't have left to uh, do, do such a thing. But when the confrontation begins, the polarization strikes out and the polarized extremes become both of them authoritarian because the opposition is not at, at, in his first administration that goes into 2007, uh, six, because he wins in 2006 his re-election and he goes into 2007 to what I consider is really his second period, the socialist period. When he goes, in, when he moves in confrontation there, the political opposition are not political parties are owners of the media, a technocrats right. of PDVSA, are the Catholic Church's cardinal, <laughs> are uh, entrepreneurs. And so these people are as authoritarian as, as, as a military man could be. And I think that what happens in the confrontation is that Charles convinces himself that he cannot do this democratically. And so uh, on the one side, he didn't, maybe he didn't want to do it, but there he convinces himself he cannot trust the Venezuelan actors first. And then secondly, he weakens this, the, the opposition in such a way that at the end of 2005, after the parliamentary elections, he is alone in the field of the game. He can do whatever he wants. And so there, I believe, is when the, his authoritarian trends to say, you know what? You, you didn't want me to do participatory democracy? Okay, now I'm doing what I want to do. 
And I really didn't, wasn't too much convinced of that. So I'm going to do socialism of the 21st century, which is completely out of democratic liberal institutions. Here we're talking about a collective uh, subject. The, the people in, 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 con, in assemblies, in the communal assemblies, voting with their hands raised and so on. And, they, and, and in, in the uh, territorial uh, divisions that he proposes and that, and that he loses in his proposal in 2007, what he was going to do was, uh, he was going to take away universal suffrage. There was not going to be any more universal suffrage in Venezuela if he would have won with, the, with his, his constitutional reform in 2006. But people uh, uh, didn't vote for that constitutional reform. And that's where I think that you may be right. I mean, there's when the continuous trend of authoritarianism begins because he cannot impose his authoritarian, his socialist project with the ballots. He has to do it with the charisma and the money and that's and with repression and that's what he does. So, so let me, let me try to circle back to the US um, because I mean, I think, I think populist leaders they stoke confrontation. The person who started confrontation in Venezuela was not the opposition, was Hugo Chavez, oh, no, day no, one, no. I swearing, taking the oath of office on the Moribund constitution, pushing a constituent assembly, whatever. So it's the, it's the populists who initiate the confrontation, they initiate the polarization. In the Venezuelan case, the opposition kind of got into it and things got worse, worse, worse. That I think is one of the big differences in the United States because in the United States, institutions are much stronger. So the opposition fortunately didn't think they had to rely on like straight protests, on mass strikes, on lockdowns like in the Venezuelan case. And I mean, what you see is in the United States, the strength of institutions and the integrity of electoral institutions has essentially induced the opposition to go a fully democratic route. And that was the lesson of the midterm elections in 2018 that you had in the US case, a dramatic increase in electoral participation. And I think we are in the middle of exactly the same thing that I think electoral participation in that election tomorrow will be much, much higher. I mean, I think the forecasts are it will be higher than for the last 100 years in the United States. And so here I go back to some optimism, which is that Trump, precisely because he is so polarizing and precisely because so many people hate the guy and can't stand the guy, I think he has stimulated such an outpouring of democratic energy, of electoral participation that I hope that like in the midterm elections of 2018, the Trump experience will come to an end in kind of a reaffirmation of American democracy. And that is facilitated by institutions that are strong and reliable. And so people go there, electoral democratic route. I think that's the big difference. Trump wanted to stop polarization and essentially the opposition has responded in very, very productive and democratic ways. Yeah, because, let me, let me uh, can I just say okay. something something to complement what, uh, what Kurt said? <laughs> okay. And it is that, um, that th what I wanted to say with the opposition was that the actors weren't political actors, you know? And so since they weren't political actors, they just went, they just right. fell into the game of polarization. You know, they just fell into that and they went to the other extreme. So the people just had to decide into one extreme and the other one. And that of course favored Chavez gave him gave him the stand to get strong and to do whatever he wanted. I mean, they, they, they bet it on polarization thinking that polarization was going to favor them. And it ended up being the other way in the military. They, they, they had the, the, the hope that the military were going to break down and do a coup and take him out of power. And it was completely the other way around. The military embraced him and sustained him throughout all those conflicts. Okay, let me, sorry, uh, we, let's go to some questions that are related to this from the, from the audience. The first one is that uh, a person here agrees that Biden was not a populist. And then the question is, but there's both a history of left populism in the US and the Sanders, Warren Democrats, at least speak in populist terms. And leftist rhetoric has long been part of 
and populist rhetoric has always part of the left. Does Trump's presidency make room for left populism or will it shut it down? That's the first question. And very related to that, the, the second question is, institutions can not only deter strong men, but institutions can also hamper good democratic changes. For instance, amendments need a third force of the states and lead to breakdown someday. So, I mean, it's not only that institutions could protect democracy from a strong man, but perhaps the strong institutions make it very difficult to have democratic change. So why don't we go with Nadia first, <coughs> and then Margarita, and to tell everybody, because both Nadia and Kurt have to teach, we will end the, the discussion at 12.45. So. Okay. So yes, as I said, according to me, Biden is not at all a populist leader. Uh, and, uh, and I understand very well uh, that uh, the characteristic of populism in the United States is different. I mean, uh, they, the, positivity, the positivity that the word populism has in the US is unique. I mean, uh, it, it was born as a democratic expansion, not a democratic shrinking. It was born at the end of the 19th century, as we know, in order to uh, turn down the, the oligarchization of the Republic and to expand the role of the ordinary people, yeomen, um, small business, and so on and so forth. So it was a democratizing process. Since then, perhaps it's very hard to uh, identify populism with the negative uh, uh, involution of the, of, of, the, of the system. I do believe that this is an issue in the States, so it's, it's very hard to use this category. However, the, 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 the um, Trump showed us in the States, perhaps for the first time in a very prominent way, that populism can have a bad uh, face also, not simply democratic face. So, and in some sense, Trump teaches us to be less, uh, less one way in interpreting populism, even in the United States, to be more uh, skeptical on the potentials for populism to create something good once they are in power. So I would insist to make a distinction between populist as movements, uh, contesting, uh, organizing, mobilizing, and populism when they are inside of the institutions as a regime or as a majority. They are two different things. We didn't see uh, the People's Party in power in the 19th, early 20th century, but we see uh, these kind of populism in power and we see how disruptive can be. So I, I would inv invite us to be more pluralistic in understanding the process of populism and to distinguish between movements and in power. Um, as to the second issue, uh, yes, uh, the mark, of course the institutions can do both things. Uh, and this depends very much on the organization of politics. You know, you have to organize if you want to change the constitution. It was changed several times, by the way, not uh, very few times, several times with amendments. So, if you do, if you uh, think that the change uh, needs to be done, you mobilize, and the more you are capable of organizing, the more you do. I understand that the founding fathers were very skeptical about autocracy, mob rule, uh, democracy, they didn't like at all. They were Republicans, and Republicans don't like very much democracy uh, since the time of the Romans. <laughs> they are very skeptical <laughs> on the people, populace or plebs and so on and so forth. So they try to do their best in order to limit the power of uh, the populace. But in doing so, they made the, they create a system that can, was also very good in limiting the power of those who had uh, authoritarian, uh, you know, um, uh, vision. So it can limit both uh, set, both sides. But I do understand that the institutions in the states were created not in order to expand democracy, but to contain democracy. Kurt. So. Oh. Does Trump's presidency create or leave room for left-wing populism? Um, I mean, 
one one short answer is it depends partly on tomorrow because if soon Biden loses, then there will be in the Democratic Party a rethinking the moderate kind of centripetal strategy didn't work. Maybe a Bernie Elizabeth Warren strategy would have worked, kind of a counter populism. But I think that in the United States political system, I don't think there's much room for left wing populism. I mean, as you hear from my accent, I'm German. And for me, after living here for more than three decades, I'm still surprised what a conservative country this is. I mean, this is a very, I mean, the fact that Trump has a shot at being reelected, I think would be unimaginable in a Central European country. And so this is a quite a conservative country. A left-wing populism would not have the shot at winning a majority. If Bernie had been the candidate, I think he would have been clearly on the path towards electoral defeat. And so that, so I don't think there is, you know, given the electoral system that you have essentially a two-party system and given the kind of fundamental conservatism of the American citizenry at these, during these times, I don't think there is much of a room. Second, institutions and can they hamper democratic changes? Yes, as Nadia said, institutions go both ways, right? I mean, institutions essentially make it difficult to have change. And so they are good because they hinder populists. Populists want to bring change. They want to transform things. And so institutions are good in hemming them in. But of course, also institutions make it difficult to bring all kinds of change. You know, think, for example, of this electoral college. When is the US ever going to get rid of this thing? Very hard to... <laughs> bring these kinds of changes. And so you see a paradox that um, the, the US system, partly because of the polarization and the depth of or the strength of checks and balances, has had a lot of gridlock and stalemate. And that is one of the reasons why you get a populist. I mean, think, for example, of immigration policy. Everybody knows that the immigration system in the United States is totally flawed. It doesn't work. There have been several efforts to have comprehensive immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform. You cannot get it through this system of checks and balances. So you have essentially, you have a blockage, you have stalemate, you have immobilism. And I think that's one reason why people then said, look, we can't get our immigration reform, go go for Trump. You know, he's going to finally do it, he's going to build that wall, that's going to resolve it. And so you see the instant the institutionally created stalemate, the gridlock is one reason why people sort of in despair go for a populist leader who promises to cut through all that stuff and finally bring change. And so in some sense, the institutions are a problem in creating that gridlock. But on the other hand, then we really need them in order to limit what a populist leader can do. And so institutions have, you know, kind of they, they bite, they cut both ways. And, um, let me see. I'm, I'm not so uh, savvy on U.S. political culture and history, but I would say that it, uh, having been a Venezuelan and um, living in the United States several times, and actually my mother was an American too, um, I would say that the contrast of the, of the culture and the history of the United States and Latin America makes it much more uh, difficult for a left-wing populism to be. I think be basically because of the individualist individualistic culture of the American people. And I would say also because um, there is this, uh, this, this, um, this idea of um, in, in Latin America that the state is important. The state in, 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 in the US, the policies are done like against the state and for the will of freedom. I mean, this craziness that you, that you can't put on a mask because you are free with your body to not put on that mask. I mean, this is something that in Latin America, I mean, it just looks crazy, completely crazy. Probably we could, we could even say that for the Germans that are kind of also state-centered, it looks outrageous. But for the American people, it is their culture, the individualism. And so anything that smells as, everything is communism, you know? 
if you if you want to impose a tax is communism if you want to if you say please put on a mask it's communism i mean everything is communism so that's why i agree with you i think sanders didn't have a chance secondly we also no, no. <laughs> you no chance no chance. <laughs> no chance for me no chance and the other thing is that i i was once many years ago at the surich institute And the Americans, um, w- w- there were a lot of Americans in this uh, psychological institute, you know, psych- uh, of deep psychology, Carl Gustav Jung in Zurich. And you, the Americans would invite entrepreneurs, you know, and they, the entrepreneurs would come to the institute and they would talk and they would admire these entrepreneurs, you know. And, it's, and then I, I, I say, yeah, and Venezuela, they would have been in probably a military, you know. <laughs> But for the American people, the values of the entrepreneurs, of the, of the man, the businessman is so important. Vis-a-vis the state and the collective that I think it's very difficult for so, populist socialism. But now with the crisis, with the pandemia, with all these things, maybe the, the, it's, it's culture can, people can be persuaded that the state has to intervene in some things in order to get the, the general... Uh, good for, for the, the common goods for the people. Secondly, well, about, as we know in history, Latin America, oligarchies were the ones that founded the Republic and they founded a Republic in a very hierarchical, discriminatory and excluente uh, society where we had racism and we had all kinds of social discrimination. So when you see in Bolivia, for example, that people say representative democracy, no way, you know, because liberal democracy is a democracy of the oligarchies. You know? And if you, and that happens in not so extreme, maybe in the countries where the indigenous people are, because until 20 years ago, they didn't even speak Spanish and, and, they, and they weren't citizens of any kind, you know? And, they, and in case of Bolivia and another and the country, they could have been 40, 50, 60% of the population. So liberal democracy in some countries is, is very easy to be uh, criminalized as the, as the responsible for so many problems that we have. And so in, in that sense, I think that's the point is how do you, how do you uh, embed the values of liberal democracy? Probably in the case of Venezuela, for example, that has had such a strong uh, inter- state that intervenes all spheres of, of life. And, and in, in a way, this happens in Mexico, this happens in other countries too, where state, we are state centered. We believe in the state. I mean, we believe in that. And I think that maybe <laughs> that this makes possible that, um, that, that the values, now that we have learned the worst way. Uh, that the state can be our enemy, like it happened with the military dictatorships in, 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 the, in the South Cone, and now it happened in Venezuela. The hard way, you will begin to have a distance with the state. Is it, wait a minute, mm. don't trust the state the way I trusted it in the past. I have to have more independence vis-a-vis the state. So I think that's, 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 a, that's a point. So I think- Non ne posso più in questa situazione. Liberal democratic changes in, in some other countries. Uh, uh, that's why populism comes again and again in Latin America. Because it tries to bring the change that is hampered by representative liberal democracy. Well, thank you, Margarita. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Kurt. Unfortunately, we have to end the event because Nadia and Kurt have to teach. Uh, It was a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate your time, especially in a moment in which we are so nervous about the future. And I hope that we have been able to clarify certain tendencies in a comparative perspective. So this has been an honor for the Center for Latin American Studies to have such a distinguished uh, group of scholars talking to us. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation.